From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet, ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. Good Friday to you. We are uh, going to do a little deal today that uh, we haven't done yet. We've got two guests with us in the studio today. And there has been a flurry of activity from the vegan community. Um, and that's that's the correct pronunciation. I, I don't want to hear all that, other, that vegan shit. It's vegan. I know how it's spelled. I know what vegetable is spelled like i know what vegetarian is spelled like and you people are vegans and you are typical leftists in that you will lie you will propagandize you will distort facts you will lie and one of the things that you lie about all the time is uh the beef industry in the united states and what we're going to do today is talk about that at length. And uh, I have with us uh, in the studio today two friends of mine. Uh, Jenny Johnson works for Timmerman Land and Cattle. And Timmerman Land and Cattle, you don't know that name, but Timmerman Land and Cattle is the largest beef producer in the United States. They have uh, cattle and land all over the country and produce millions of head of cattle a year into the beef market in the United States. And with me is my dear old friend Richard Lehman. Uh, I've known Richard about 45 years. And uh, Richard has been in the cattle industry since he was 16. So was it 52 years you've been Absolutely. In the cattle business, and Richard knows where all the skeletons are buried. All right? We're going to talk to <laughs> both of these people today about uh, about the beef industry in the United States. Thank you guys for coming in. You bet. I dragged them in off the street from work, so. Not a problem. I'm glad to have, the, glad to have you here. Let's talk about... Let's talk about the beef industry in the United States because this has been so mischaracterized. If you talk to people from Brooklyn or from San Francisco or from Seattle, city people that have never been around a tree that somebody else didn't put there, you know, they don't know what goes on out here in flyover country. They have no idea. They don't look out the window of the airplane when they fly from JFK to LAX. They don't look out the window. They just sit there and watch the movie. And they don't know about the country. They don't know anything about what we do here. And what I wanted to talk about today was how is beef produced? Okay, and it's... uh, it's an interesting question because of the fact that the vegan community, as I previously previously mentioned, will lie about this. They lie about it every day. Factory farming is their term that they use. All right. Now, let's let's just get kind of a, a what is your what is your opinion of it? You've heard all this stuff too, okay. right? One of the things we need to kind of clear up is while there are some large cattle producers, 80% of the cattle in this country are in herds of 30 or less. 80%? Uh, approximately 80% are in herds of 30 or less. They're, they're little people they're like me and small you. Small producers. Mm-hmm. And, right. And, uh, of course, I, I started out on that end. I was a small producer, and I, I run about 150 mama cows now. I've right. grown, and I have a ranch in Texas and, and a corresponding place in Oklahoma, both sides of the of the Red River. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lot of misconception about how these cattle are treated. I mean, we yes. we yeah. are absolutely stewards of our cattle. We treat them the very best. Uh, well, you have no choice. 
you know, and this is another, this is people, oh. one of the, one of the giant misconceptions here is that it's cheaper to treat them bad Absolutely, that it is, oh, to che- yeah, wow. it oh, is that, to treat them good. That's and crazy. I, work. The economics dictate the treatment. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and what they want to see in the packing plants is an animal that's free of bruises. That's not crazy. Uh, his economics are entirely better than one mm-hmm. that's been in, in any form mistreated. Right. You know, he's the, he, the, this good treatment animal is the one that'll make money for everybody. Right. And, uh, when you talk about the vegetarians, one of the things that, that they're missing the whole concept here is they're getting a vegetable burger, but they're not getting a healthy, wholesome beef burger. Right. The real thing. Mm-hmm. What they're getting is a burger that's loaded with uh, artificial flavor, they, colors. They, they eat basically uh, additives. Absolutely. They're, they're, it's the <laughs> it's the difference between coffee mate and milk. Let's don't forget right. preservatives. Right. If you don't want to eat beef, why do you want your burger to taste like beef? Like beef. There you go. Isn't, isn't that funny? I, I don't get it. It is funny as hell. Uh they they can't really get past that, can they? Uh I think the vegans are proud of the fact that they don't eat anything that looks like beef, but but I'm you know, and, and we get questions about this on our seminars all the time. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, veganism is an eating disorder, and I'm not a psychologist. I'm a strength coach, and I deal with the best way to get strong and recover from training, and that's with animal protein. So I don't want to go into. I don't want to talk about these people very much. I, what I want to do is tell everybody else that's interested where does beef come from. All right. Now, Timmerman's organization, tell us about that. Okay. You, you've talked to him about this, and he said, go ahead and tell him. Right. So t- and, and I'll tell you right now, the, the vegans have said that the ranchers and the farmers won't talk about this. Oh, we're openly to talk. We want to talk about it. Certainly. We want to educate everybody on what we're doing every day. Right. You know, so Timmerman LLC wants to take from the very start to the very beginning we know exactly where our beef has come from mm-hmm. how they're backgrounded right how they were raised right what they're fed mm-hmm. from start to finish right i mean and, and if you know we raise all of a lot of our own calves so we know mm-hmm. The background of cows, but the cattle that we buy or that they go out and buy to turn out and raise, they too, they're coming from backgrounded other ranches from right. other parts of the thing. So, <clears throat> you know, you you want to know. We truly want to know, and and we care about where those cattle came from and how they were treated previously right. to us, and you know, and how they're tracked with the new electronic IDs in their mm-hmm. ears, and and you so you can track that same. Calf A, from the time he hits the ground until the time, you know, he goes to the solar plant. You know his whole history. And they strive to do that sure. with all of them, with sure. all of the cattle. One, one of the biggest things that we do, Mark, we are grass growers. We harvest. Our biggest right. crop is grass. Is grass. You are grass farmers. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and we harvest it with our calves. Now, it's it's interesting that people seem to think that we're raising cattle in factories all right the fact of the matter is is that uh, most of the land in the united states can't be farmed that's absolutely and and it can't be farmed for topography for water supply rainfall rainfall there's all kind of reasons why you can't farm everything but you can graze it but you can graze it Mm -hmm. so you make it productive by farming the grass absolutely that's on it and turning the grass into meat and that's basically what the cattle industry does absolutely most of the time there there are specific breeds that are adapted to different environments uh a lot of people don't know this but the brahma breed are a different species yeah They're, they are boss indicus. 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 indicus while the british and and uh English breeds mm-hmm. are Bostaurus, mm-hmm. and they're they're more adapted to higher, drier climates, and 
while these bromers they thrive on the heat and humidity yes and uh, but they're they're a good cross you can you can intermix these bloodlines and find something that's very good for the central divisions of climate Mm -hmm. you know like north texas and right uh, now there are two basic ways to produce beef into the into the market from the from the producer standpoint uh if i understand this correctly you can run heifers like richard does breed the heifers get a calf crop raise the calf crop and sell that yes sir or you can buy calves yes sir graze them Grow them buy calves from somebody else. Get them bigger. Graze them and sell the gain. Yep, absolutely. That's another right. One. Those are the two yeah. basic streams yeah. that a producer deals with in terms of the, in terms of the market. So what is what does Timmerman do? Both. We do both. See the place that I manage here. You know, I have X a number of mama cows. Mm-hmm. So we're raising our own, but we don't here at this place in Texas. We don't keep the heifers. We don't keep any replacement heifers. Right. So if we come and we want to need to replace some cows, we'll just go and buy new mama cows. New mama cows, breed them, and then from the time the calf hits the ground Mm -hmm. until the time you're through with him, how long is that? He's he's about a year, really, by the time he leaves me. Because when I wean over here, you know, it's six months, six, seven months of age, they just go still here in Wichita, but to another location right. and t- grazed out on wheat until right. May. And they'll leave here weighing nine, 900 to 1,000 pounds. And then right. from there they go and finish at the feed yard. Right. And then the other in the stream meantime, is buying stalker calves. In the meantime, that calf's mother has calved again, and right. the circle goes around again. Here, right. we, here we go for a but new you year. You strive. You have to. What we're, t- what we're taking care of is the mama cow. Sure. And she is she is golden and she makes you money yeah absolutely, absolutely. she makes you money just like dairy cows they make mm-hmm. you money so you treat them good what is uh what's the average useful lifespan of a of a mama cow oh depends on i how many of you got that are 10 oh probably over half of them that are probably 10 to 15 yeah, 10 to 15 <laughs> 10 years to 15 old. years yeah. that they're about used up when yeah. they're 15 years old you, you better be Thinking replacements, right? Yep. And we ship them and, and ship them and start a young cow. Start start, start, a, start another one. Yeah. So, stalker calves. If you're not going to raise from from heifers, breeding heifers and making your own calf crop, what do you do? There's a ready market. There's a ready calf market everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other producers in the state. There's there's uh, community sales. A lot of calves come through the livestock markets, and uh, the big operators, of course, you're not able to raise enough cattle for what you want to graze out uh, as yearlings, so you buy calves. Mm-hmm. And in a world of those cattle come from the southeast, Florida, and Georgia, and Mississippi, even even Kentucky and Tennessee. A world of cattle come from the east to the west because it's cheaper to send the calf to the feed than it is to send the feed to the calf. Right. Because there's a lot less pounds involved. So you're, and, they, you'll buy calves that have been weaned. Yep. And then when they're ready to graze, you'll buy them at that age, put them out on, on, them on pasture the wheat. Yep. or on wheat. Now, when we say wheat, what we mean is is wheat is sown in October, yep. and it is harvested in around here, 1st of June, last of May. Yep, yes, sir. And from the time it comes up in November, and it gets six inches high. On the forage producing stage of it, we graze these cattle. On the wheat. And typically get two, and two pounds, two to three and a half pounds per day per calf gain. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we're selling is uh, right. the gain on these calves. Right. And then you'll pull them off, what, February 15th, something like yep. that. Yep. And then go ahead and raise the wheat crop, harvest the wheat harvest crop. So wheat. you've used it twice. Mm-hmm. Hopefully. That's, that's Hopefully. the ambition. Depending yeah. on the rain. Yes, sir. You've used it twice. Yeah, depending on that and which the markets. Is which terribly is, efficient. It can be, yes. Yeah. Yep. And then those calves, mm-hmm. those calves at 850 to 1,000 pounds go to a feed yard, and they're fed corn, which turns their fat white, puts marbling in the steaks, and makes them grade more. And, right. And then, then they typically go to the public. They okay. go to restaurants, supermarkets. 
Uh, right. We're going to talk about the beef itself a little bit more later, but uh, let's say what percentage of of uh, of Timmerman's production is half is, is calf crop versus stocker cattle? I bet it's a 70, 30. Right. 40. And they've got, they own grass and they lease grass, right? Yeah, they both. do both. Both. Right. Um, and let, we'll just talk, we'll just use here in Texas, for right. instance, is, you know, we lease this, you know, we lease grass over here mm -hmm. and then they own the wheat on the other side, mm -hmm. you know, but they own ranches all over the United States that run the same amount, if not more, mama mm -hmm. cows than I've got. Mm -hmm. This is the only place that uh, typically turns out the wheat cattle, only because the, the rest of the places are up north and they don't grow the winter wheat up there mm -hmm. like we do down here. Right. But, you know, they buy uh, a lot of stalker calves from the north, buy a lot of the northern calves, mm -hmm. those good calves from those big producers up there off those big ranches and bring them down here where it's warmer. Those right. calves do Easier really, on them. They do really, really well coming from cold to, you know, right. warmer climate. Less climbing. stress on them down here mm -hmm. through the And they, they gain really the well and they get they get really big. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do really well. Yeah. And, and your sickness is The opposite nothing. is true. The southern calves going to a northern climate mm -hmm. suffer. They're not acclimated. Yeah. And that's one, right. of, that's one of the hurdles you have to jump with the southern and southeastern calves is to get them acclimated. So if if in Texas we're buying them from the southeast, that's kind of a lateral move. Whereas Florida cattle, Florida panhandle cattle going to Montana is probably not what you'd call a good idea. No, it's tough. <laughs> it's that tough. can be really tough, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, cattle, yeah. they do. They get altitude sickness just, just like people do. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know all about that. Altitude's hard on them. Absolutely, it is. Hard on an old guy, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> When when you get twelve month old, eight fifty to thousand pound cattle, and you send them to the to the, to the feed yard, are these proportionally, are, are these mostly steers, or is it a mix of heifers and steers? Well, I'd say it's fifty fifty. About fifty yeah. fifty. Yeah. That's about what your calf crop is. Is sure. fifty fifty. Sure, of course. And and a, an equal amount of heifers probably go to the feed yard as the steer calves. The steer calves are a little more. Uh, they're a little more economical because they feed a little bit better. They they gain a little bit faster, and right. they're not they're not as prone to <clears throat> as much fat. There's not as much waste in a steer as there is a heifer carcass. Right. And uh, the the end product is worth a little bit more than a heifer. So if there is a factory aspect to this industry, it's the feedlot business. Yes, sir. Right. So yes, what's sir. a feedlot look like? Oh, uh, it's a big area of cattle pens with feed bunks. And they've got uh, a hospital pen, just like everybody else. If they've got something sick, they're going to do their very best to keep him alive and to treat him humanely and, and get him over whatever ails him. So we can sell him. So we can sell him. He's ultimately right. going to go on the food chain. And sure. uh, it, it's to everybody's advantage to take care of these things. They're not just kicked out there and, and forgotten about, dump feed out to them and don't look at them. They're, they're managed daily. Oh. Those pens, those feed oh, yards, my those those men and women that work in those feed yards spend numerous amount of hours riding through and looking they, through and studying. They the look cattle. at every right. head every you day. Everybody is looked at every, every day. day. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 To watch and see if something's getting sick. Because something's mm -hmm. if something's getting sick, it's going to get everything else sick. We got to we got to call yeah. that thing and, and, they, they and treat it. Out. And he right. will not enter the food chain. If he's a sick animal, he will right. not. Mm -mm. Uh, now, Jenny told me something that that I found interesting the other day. Timmerman is running, uh, and this is associated with the with the feedlot question because everybody always thinks that that uh, cattle are given hormones and antibiotics all the time. Uh, this is absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. Mm. Absolutely not true. You're telling me that Timmerman is trying, it participates, a huge part of their cattle participate in the hormone-free program. Hormone-free beef, yes. Right. So let's talk about hormones and antibiotics here in a little while. Let's, 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 but I want to, I want to discuss that at length because there's so 
much misconception about this. But feedlots, all right, are they're, they're are out in the country. They're big, giant groups of pens. And the cattle are fed basically all they can eat every day for usually 90 days, right? So they're standing around with their buddies eating donuts basically all day. And what are they typically fed? Is it corn? Yeah. It, it's, or is it, it a ration? It, it's a ration that varies about how big your cattle are in the feed yard. Right. So if you have a pen of five weights, right. their ration is not the same as your nine weights. Right. In those feed yards, it's they have it down to a science of what these oh, calves yes. get, you know, per head, per day, mm -hmm. and how much. And they know how much each one of the each one of the animals is eating per day, Absolutely. in terms of calories and protein, fat, carbohydrate, all that. Most of the yards, nutrition science. Stuff. Most of the yards have a nutritionist on mm -hmm. staff, right? To uh, to feed these calves the most economical way they can to get the most amount most of gain, gain on him in the shortest amount of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's all about economics. Now, if you talk about steroids. A lot of the yards today. They have all natural cattle. It's what because they're, they're worth more money. It's what they're demanding because of the is. public perception. It's, it's what exactly. the public is yeah. demanding. Right. It is. They're going right. to meet that demand, and if that's what they require, they've got a certain amount of cattle to meet that demand. Right. Their other cattle, they do use steroids. Years ago, it was still Besterol, and they've mm -hmm. stopped Di DES. Di DES. Di DES. Di they've stopped Di the use of that, but they they never were able to show anything negative about. Still best for all. It was right. a good growth hormone. And now Ralgro, both right. of these compounds are non steroidal. They're actually non steroidal estrogen like compounds. They're not actually steroids. There you go. And uh, so the perception is is all cattle are fed hormones. Right? That's true. And the perception is that all cattle in the feedlot are fed antibiotics. No. They, not we true. don't we don't Why want would you to spend the money exactly. on it? When it's not if necessary. The, when the animal is not sick. There you go. That I mean, antibiotics are not free. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as they're not free, we don't, you know, I, I, I don't, do you guys just spend money just because it's, it's fashionable? That's not what happens. They're also you know? closely regulated now. Well, right. The, all antibiotics come with a veterinary prescription mm -hmm. today. All uh, a large amount of them, and by 2020... For, for an animal. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. For an individual animal. Yes, sir. Not for the whole damned herd, because that's the perception. Is this... They're just shoveling these drugs out and giving every animal in the feed yard all these drugs. It's not true. It's no, it's but not that, never, it's that doesn't stop them from true. saying it, though. No, Because it's not. it's a useful lie. The, the the big problem with our public today, as close as they are to agriculture, was their great grandfather. Yes, and and they've grown away from that. They've grown away from the family farm. It doesn't exist for a lot of people anymore. No, no. And, and the the majority of the public has no idea what they have. What you guys a, do? What they have? No idea. A, a lot of misconceptions. Yes, and uh, that have been fostered by the media. Sure. Absolutely, because it's useful sure. to make everybody hate everybody else. You know, passion is 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 what's is what's fashionable. So, uh, feedlots uh, will take a twelve month beef and turn him into a fifteen month beef. Ninety days of feed, and then he, when he's done, and is there a way? They, or is it just a ninety day prescription? How's that decided? Do they look at the carcass? They look at the animal and decide how he's going to kill. And a lot of it's weight. Yep. Just want him to a certain weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They'll run those calves down the alley and, and weigh them things at a certain point because mm -hmm. they pretty much know. They've been doing this for a while, mm -hmm. and they know what those calves, what percentage meat he's going to cut out and just about what right. percentage bone and fat. Mm -hmm. They know when they get to a certain weight that it's time to butcher that calf. And you know it's it's interesting to me uh, that the terminal beef market is the grocery store. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. A sirloin steak needs to take up a certain amount of shelf space on the little styrofoam tray. If it's this big, 
like would come off of a of a three year old. A three year old Charlotte. He ain't gonna fit. He's not gonna fit on. The, he's not gonna fit on the shelf. We want the sirloins to be about this big, and that's and that's when we kill, because it fits the terminal beef market. I appeal. Yes, I appeal. Absolutely. But it's shelf space. The stores. Yeah. It's that too. It, it, it all of these things factor in to the to the to the kill weight. Of these cattle. Even the packers are very conscious about size. If they get too big, they can't hang them up. They drag on the floor. Their processing right. plant won't, mm-hmm. right. won't right. fit that. Thing. No, I've seen that. And, and they don't want them. Right. So you've created a, an animal that's worth less to the trade right. than, than the optimum. He might sell and, real and well in the custom beef market, but not, could, but not, in, but the commercial not in the commercial market right. where everything needs to be about the same size because we want the steaks to be about right. the same size. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, right. there, there are niche markets. Right. With their, the Japanese calves are the rage right now. These Wagyu's, mm-hmm. uh, there's a boy in Austin that's feeding them things 400 days. But it costs you a... Costs Can you, you imagine a, what the hell that costs? Cost you $100 to eat a steak off one of his calves. Right. But he has a niche People market. People will pay for it. And they're doing it. And People it, will pay uh, for it. That's I, absolutely I true. I understand that they're delicious. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, you can get an awfully nice steak down here at McBride's or uh, <laughs> uh, the Pelican. For, I'm absolutely for less For about than a fifth of that, right. Yes, sir. Right. I guess we need to talk about the slaughter industry. We started started on that a few minutes ago and got sidetracked. Uh, I mean, it's obvious if we're going to make beef, we got to kill the cow to do it, right? How is this accomplished? It's done humanely, Mark. They use what they call a captive bolt pistol, mm-hmm. and it's got a charge behind a dart, and it hits him in the lower part of his skull, and he never well, he never feels it. Right He'll, between the eyes, he penetrates the skull about that far, about an inch and a half, two inches. He never feels it. Suddenly, he, he'll drop in place. His right frontal there. cortex, and he mm-hmm. falls down. They'll they'll bleed that calf out. Then they cut his throat. Cut his throat. Haul him up on the hooks. And he becomes. Skin him and gut him. Yes, sir. Then they, once they get that done, they split him right down the middle and he becomes two sides. They take great care not to let any of his intestines, any of the internal fluids. Oh, absolutely. Great, great pains to none of that ever touches his beef because that's where you get E. coli. E. coli and and some of the Other types of contamination. Contamination, absolutely. But the, the, the popular version of this is that the, the cows are all tortured and mishandled right up until they're walked down a chute and they're yelling and screaming and there's people hitting them with hot shots and they're tortured with mm. electricity and they shoot them with 22s and all if this other If you go shit. to a packing plant, if you yeah. take a, a haul a load of cows, to the, say the truck driver takes you don't. You can't have a hot shot. You can't take. You can't, can't take one out of your pickup. That's correct. You it's not even it. allowed, it's not even on, allowed the on the property. Property. That's true. That is absolutely right. true. Yeah. So that's no. That's so not true. Well, but, yeah, but it's useful. Useful. It's useful to lie about. So yeah. because we're supposed to, we're supposed to just blindly accept the story that the meat that you're eating tonight was tortured before you are going to eat it so that you won't eat it, right? And that's nothing could be further from the truth. These animals are they're handled humanely because it doesn't make monetary sense to stress the animals before you kill that's them. That's absolutely right, Mark. And you, you need to stop and think. It's really a daunting task it to is. feed a growing population with a finite amount of land Right. It is a daunting task, and there are more people every day. Right, and, and we're we have the same, way better at it than we were 50 years they're ago. They're not making any more land. Right. And our public needs to realize what a wonderful job we are doing. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't think they do. and I th- Most of them don't care because they don't think about it. Well, I don't, and I don't really want to get off into the weeds about the, the quality of, of animal protein versus plant protein because – you know, a lot of a lot of people more qualified than our than ourselves have addressed that addressed that topic. We don't know enough about it to talk about it, but we we do understand, of course, that 
animal proteins, higher quality protein in terms of amino acid profile and plant protein. And that's why we eat meat. One of the, the first organized human activity 150,000 years ago was hunting. So let's, there's a reason for this. We're omnivores, and we like meat. We, so, were, we were hunters and gatherers at the beginning. At the, at, the, at the inception. From the inception, we've eaten meat. You guys don't want to eat meat, then don't eat meat. Leaves more for me. But it's important to understand that when you are being told things like we're torturing these animals before we, before we slaughter them. They're humanely slaughtered. They're treated humanely right up until the point where we kill them. Because to do anything else is not only undesirable just from a moral standpoint, but it's stupid. Really? It's stupid. We don't. They, you, the the highest grade of carcass is what is what you want out of the animal, and a mistreated animal does not produce a high grade carcass. What are they? Let's say you've got a cow that you've got hanging up, you've got two sides off this cow, and there's a great big giant bruise or a broken leg or whatever on this on this side. I'm assuming the sides are evaluated separately. Diseased cattle can't even go down the chute. That's correct. But let's say he gets injured in the chute. What do they do? That meat will go to uh, alternate choices. It won't go to the supermarket. Right. Yeah. And... As a result, it's worth less money. Absolutely worth as, less as money. As a result of it being worth less money, it's in everybody's best interest to not let to not an injury that. like that happen. Absolutely. Right? And I, I don't know any other way to, I don't know a more clear explanation for why we don't mistreat these animals. They're not worth as much money if they're mistreated. And we're in this for the money. Right? If we were I mean, only in it for the yeah. money, Mark... Uh, we're, we're, there's other ways to make money. You can <laughs> absolutely. You damn bet you. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now. We love what we do. Sure. Uh, it's it was sure. It was part of my life growing up. It's a lifestyle and, that we and, prefer, uh, and you we, know we love what we do. That's and why I live we, outside of town. We love you know, our animals. And always have. We love our animals. I'm telling. You, we take the best care of them things that we possibly can because they're taking care of us. Right. Right. Uh, this is this is hard for people to wrap their heads around. I guess because of all the pop, all the propaganda they've been fed about what the meat industry does to to its livestock uh, at every point in the in the production stream. So uh, I think that pretty much covers the the production part of this thing, at least in the detail we want to do it here. Let's talk about the beef itself. Uh, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, that there is so much variability in the meat that comes from different animals of different breeds in in the in the beef market. What uh, does does Timmerman, for example, look for a, a a cattle bred a certain way? Do they have different programs for for cattle that are bred? different ways that they got a british program and a and a no and in a bramer program or we, we try to keep what we call the english beef the english mm -hmm. breeds um which are the herefords and angus and shorehorns and, and, and that type of stuff the, the ones that are you know gain you know the most right. and you know if we have some longhorn we have a lot of longhorn bred cows longhorn cross cows Mm -hmm. um, but when they all go to the feed yard, those calves that are leaner calves, right. longhorn beef is leaner beef, right. will be in a different, they'll sort those, they'll grade they'll them sort different. those on, they'll grade them different, right. and they'll, they'll be in their own little program, I guess. Which they'll feed them word, differently feed also. Them differently, yeah. right? As opposed yep. to these over here. they'll produce differently. Right. Yep. And by produce, we mean the ratio of bone to meat. Yep, absolutely, yes. absolutely. <coughs> the grade of the carcass. And, mm -hmm. and the, 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 amount, the number of these calves will grade choice at a certain day of age. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's what you're looking for is choice beef. Right, and some, some breeds of cattle just won't grade choice. There, there are cattle feeders. 
that like to feed only Holsteins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is the Holsteins, their genetics are almost identical. They'll, those calves will almost all feed the same. They'll grade the same. They'll eat the same amount of feed. These guys know what Holsteins are going to do in the feed yard mm -hmm. when they start them. Right. And it's not true with black calves. Uh, a set of black calves can be Angus base, or they could be half Simmentals. Mm -hmm. And the, the number of prime and choice calves will differ according to their According breed. to the breed, yes. sure. And, uh, Most of the higher grades of beef... And the beef, beef grades from the top down prime, and that, that constitutes 4 to 5% of the, of the beef killed in the United States, grades prime. It it's, doesn't happen very much. And next down from that is choice. These are terms that you should be familiar with from the grocery store. Choice beef is right below prime, and the beef industry divides that into thirds, Lower third, middle third, upper third, upper two thirds. Yep. The more marbling. And this has to do with marbling, the fat with interstitial fat in the meat itself, not the cap of fat right. on the it's, outside it, of the it, carcass. It's, it's the, the fat in the, the fat muscle. In the muscle. The intramuscular fat yep. is the way these things are graded. And below choice is select. And below select is. Utility and is cutter. that is that what they yeah, and then correct. the and then the bottom is cutter canner, yep. so cutter canner is where an injured steer would go. Yes, you know if he's real beat up and he's bruised and stuff, cutter canner goes to dog food and and uh, processed products that are just primarily interested in the protein. You know, and I, I think probably most hamburger comes from select carcasses. Flavor and tenderness is in your prime and choice cuts. Right. That's what that's what they're after in the the uh, the lead markets. Your steakhouses. The, the steakhouse and, market is uh, you, you find a lot of prime beef in some steakhouses, uh, but most of the time uh, you're going to be served choice, choice beef. Steak. That's that's at a steakhouse. The, yep. Yeah, that's the lion's share of mm -hmm. steakhouse beef is choice. Right. High choice. And most choice beef is going to come from British bred cattle. And the British breeds, again, are the Angus, the Herefords, Shorthorns, some oddball stuff like Devons. And, yeah. yeah well, you know, but these are all little bitty short cows. They're... Uh, I can't remember the number, but there's over 300 breeds of cattle. It's big. Oh, it's a bunch, a much, huge much amount cattle. of different breeds. And then the, uh, and then the for the for the the select market, probably the continental breeds are responsible for most of that. And continental breeds, what they call the continental breeds, are France and Germany. So the Charleys, the, Charlais, the Bronvies, Simmentals, uh, the big ones. Main well, end juice. They're right. all, they're, uh, These are all continental cattle. Yep. Simmental, limousines. Yep. These big French cattle. Yep. Developed in They're the taller, place. quite a bit taller. They might weigh a third again as much as a Angus the same age. And uh, if you're looking for the ability to turn grass into beef... Uh, cattle bred continental are probably better at that. They're they're excellent. Better they at that excellent. than the than the, the than the British breeds. Yeah, they're your money right. makers. That's that makes money. That's where you take grass you pasture mm -hmm. that yep. you can't farm. Yeah. and turn it into beef. But you can't forget there's a place for the boss indicus cattle. Those mm -hmm. old cattle are they're heat resistant. You can put them in rough rough country and they're browsers. They're Mm -hmm. they, they'll they'll graze up somewhat when an Angus cow only grazes down. Uh, right. The the browsers have their place, you know. Right. So. Just so you'll know what we're talking about: grazing animals eat grass, browsing animals eat leaves. Yeah. For yeah. example, That's deer right. are browsers. Yeah. Well, the right. braver cattle and will, elk are grazing. They, they will do both, both now. Right. But, but you'll seldom see an Angus cow browsing, and you'll right. see those old braver cows 
browsing quite a bit. Right. So yeah. South Texas is going to be pretty thoroughly dependent rough, on rough on country, rough, heat resistant. Yep. And you'll see it's, a lot of those cattle right there. That's that's their homeland in America. Right. It's, is the South the what, deep South? What breed did they develop on the King Ranch out of? Out of uh, Santa Santa Gertrudis. The Santa Gertrudis. Yeah, the they're, they're the famous. The Brahma and Shorthorn. Right. Developed. That's what they originally. Shorthorn were. being a British breed. So they, yep. when they cross a continental cow with a, with a, with a British cow, they're they're trying to get characteristics of, of both. Of both. Right. Yep. Typically, obviously, you, you get the hybrid, and mm-hmm. he'll have characteristics of both, and that they have what they call hybrid vigor. Right, and those old cattle will thrive uh, under harsh conditions. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what you're after when you cross these two breeds. So, what do you guys do uh, out there around me? What kind of what kind of cows? What kind of mama cows you got? What do you breed them with? What's the what's that breeding program look like? We have in terms a, of the breeds a mixture of your crossbred cattle. We have the, the Longhorn crosses and the Santa Catrudis cattle, and it's just kind of a little bit of everything. You got a lot but of spots on them. A lot of spots, but they're all crossed uh, back to the Charlay bulls to have a Charlay calf. Right. You know, a cross half, red half, calf. half continental Charlay calf. Uh, I had a rancher in Montana tell me one time that the, he called a he called a spotted cattle. He called them. Texas cattle. <laughs> no. They look like Texas cattle to him. They've got yeah, a lot of color. Mm-hmm. I will use longhorn bulls on British breed heifers because you'll get a, a little light birth weight. Mm-hmm. Light birth weight so the, a younger heifer can you, you stand it. Right? You don't have to live with that heifer and watch and, and assist her in her birth. You right. Know, that, uh, that little calf will hit the ground running. Mm-hmm. And that that's been the savior of the Longhorns, really, is that low birth weight. Yeah. Really, I guess that is primarily yeah. the that's yeah. the 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 primary yeah. reason to use them now. That and because you don't want a great big old long horned hooky well, <laughs> creature trying to kill everybody. That's been the, the hobbyist in, in every <clears throat> breed is big, but the the hobbyist Longhorn breeders are out there and and uh, they have their place. I've, right. I've gotten bulls from them that were excellent low birth weight bulls. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, a lot of them are ready to raise them just for horn growth. They're beautiful. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we've all seen those. A lot of on people the hoods of cattle. A lot of people want a set of those things <laughs> on their hood. Right. right yeah. Right. The economics of the cattle market uh, are interesting. There are there are little divisions within the market based on on what things. Well, what what I've done is that I run, I, I'm friends with a with a guy that that raises bulls for the PBR bucking bulls. Right. And right. I I run his bucking bull calves on wheat pasture. And how are they bred? Well, right. <laughs> an interesting question. Yeah. A lot of those things originally that spotted calves with the red inside their ears or black inside their ears were white park cattle. White park. White park. They're, I have never heard of that. They're a breed of their own, mm-hmm. and uh, they're white and just their ears uh, and their nose. And beautiful, feet. beautiful spots. Black. Yeah. Right. Uh, oh, they're beautiful. But they crossed them things on Boss Indicus bulls and put some muscle on that white park, and them things jump mm, high. They're big and athletic creatures. Jump high and kick hard. And <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, God Almighty! People don't understand so, how how strong these animals are. Remember when Karen, my sister Karen, had one of one of your bulls at her house one time down there, and this was a big white creature, hmm. and I don't remember how he was bred. I think he had some he had a little, little bit of ear on him or something. something but he, yeah. he was a big and and she used him to breed her cattle down there and. Uh, we had him gathered up in a pen, and Richard was coming down to get him that day to get him off the place. And I don't know what something pissed him off real bad, <laughs> right? And he's standing in a in the in the pen, and he starts looking around like that, and 
and we're standing there by the by the by the fence and he starts looking around for a place to land and I said let's get out of the way <laughs> and that goddamn thing flat footed jumped over yeah. that five and a half foot fence. You're talking about just I well, not running. I mean he just turned around and just high jumped over the thing. Eight, and eighteen hundred pounds 18, of muscle. Eighteen hundred pounds of muscle in the air without a running start. Now if you just have to see that done to believe it. But the <laughs> the damn things are amazing animals. Yeah. They really yeah, are. They are. Now, what about the Corriente market? Uh, Corrientes are a Mexican breed that make nice shaped little horns. They're, and have they're you ever, all, and they use them in rodeos. I have for, a few Corriente cows. For bulldogging and, and, and roping and stuff, steer yeah. roping. And you too, it goes back to a lot of people use a Corriente bull for the low birth weight Low birth weight. Oh, they make, they're mm-hmm. used Excellent. for that also. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But those, those are sport cattle. They call them they're sport cattle, referred to as sport cattle, and uh, but they're not abused. Rodeo is not abusive to cattle. I mean that's a misnomer of huge proportions. The sport rodeo is as old as America is itself. Mm-hmm. It came with the conquistadors, and who first introduced cattle to to the American continent. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, it's a whole different world. Well, but yeah. they're they are highly taken care of the bucking bulls. You oh, talk the about bucking bulls that's are cared for. Oh my God, yes. They're uh, treated better than they're most treated people. better than than absolutely uh, anything there is. Yeah, yeah. If they're, you go to a rodeo and you see the the bucking bulls in the pen out there, they're relaxing between absolutely between goes yeah. and yeah. and they're <laughs> they they learn their job and and, and uh, they just lay down and. And most of them are wiggle good. their ears around. And most stuff. of them are good at it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, and just so people in New York City understand this, a flank strap is what makes the bull buck, and the flank strap is a belt that goes between the cow's TT and his. Balls. It, it's actually and around it goes, his waist. It's, it's around not, what on a cow is on a it, bull is his waist. his waist. And it doesn't have nails in it. It doesn't have electricity <laughs> in oh it. My it doesn't have tacks sewed into it. <laughs> it is a strap. It's a leather belt. And you put it on him and it's got a buckle on top of it. And when they load him into the chute, they put the they put the belt on him, put the bucket strap on him, and right before they open the door to the chute, they pull it tight. Now, this pisses him off. At most, it's an irritant. <clears throat> it's an irritant. But more than anything, an experienced buck and bull it's has his learned, cue. It has is learned his cue. that when the strap goes on, he bucks. He does his And job. he tries to get the cowboy off sure. his back. Sure. It doesn't hurt him. It you know yeah and 90 percent of them are gonna will do it without it right because yeah. that's what they're bred to do and they, they, they love they, it they learn that when you the door know. opens they yeah. buck this is just yeah. his this is just his cue sure. to try to get the cowboy off his back sure now i would imagine that every once in a great while a particularly athletic bull will run into the fence or run the cowboy into the fence but i assure you people in New York City that the cowboys get hurt way more than the than the bulls. <laughs> way, Absolutely. way more than the bulls do. I don't want that God, I've seen some stuff. I've seen bulls that do things that you cannot believe that they're able to do. Jumping up in the air eight feet off the ground with a guy on his back. It's just and turn a circle before he lands back down on yep. the floor. That's these it's things amazing. are amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. They're amazing animals. Yeah. And something that's that entertaining is taken real good care of. Absolutely. What other niche markets are there? Oh, I guess like it's some a- of the Longhorns, hobbyists. But there are people that specialize in growing heifers, replacement heifers for other producers. That mm-hmm. Specialize. And then, then there are producers that specialize in bulls. Mm-hmm. Uh, high 
grading good bulls for somebody right. putting their beef herd. Right. You know, bulls that have right. proven that Pro- proven their, their, genetics. their get Absolutely. will grade high. Yes. Up toward prime. Yes, and th- those are typically niche markets. Right. Uh, and and that's a growing thing. It's that's a way to survive in in the volatility of of the open market. What percentage of the prime beef market goes to is already bought goes to restaurants under contract? You you just don't hardly see prime beef in the store. Mark, I don't know. That's a good yeah, question, but I, I wouldn't know. I bet the it's exact the far, answer, but... vast majority of it's probably already committed to for it. Yeah. Yeah. So if something comes through the plant and they cut it at six they they grade the beef by cutting the the carcass between the sixth and the seventh rib and looking at the ribeye and looking at the marble and i would imagine i don't know if you can confirm this if if a carcass comes through the plant and it it happens to grade prime then it's pulled out and it's stuck in another room but and there it's hung up at the packers yeah, that's so what I mean, Packers at the have, Packers. The Packers have already given us, as the producers, our money. You know, it was it last week? It was like, Yeah, no, was you won't be paid on the grade. No, right. That's so big. you're not paid on the grade. The Packers the, are making that. If they can find a bunch of prime beef in yeah. this bunch of steers, mm-hmm. then the Packers make the money on it because mm-hmm. then it sells. They've got buyers. And you got there, paid a dollar fifteen for the thing. and You're paying eight something. Oh, pound oh, way at more. The grocery store. Well, you're paying eight a pound at the grocery store for, for choice. Yeah, yeah. For hamburger. choice. Yeah, so it's yeah, not, you're paying five dollars for hamburger. It's not the producers that's raking in the money. No, no, that no. You're no. buying it at the grocery store for it. Not at all. No, there's 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 profit built into this thing at every step. At every mm-hmm. level. At every because obviously there has to be or we wouldn't do it. Right. Right. But the the feeders have got buyers out there that are looking for specific right. type cattle right. that are statistically known to grade better than right. than other cattle. And uh, <clears throat> we try to serve. I, I look at that all the time. I try to match what them guys are looking for. I try right. to breed what they're looking for. They want black of, skin. Right. If, if, they want uh, Angus-looking cows. Right. Or, if pink ones made the most money, I would have pink bulls. <laughs> right. Does you know I've I've always heard that there's not really much difference between the way a, a red Angus will grade and a black Angus will grade, but from what I understand, the black Angus get bring command a higher price even than the red that will grade the same way because the perception among the 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 Packers is that black cattle grade higher. Right. They now, don't want to have to think about it. Statistically, they black cattle will feed more efficiently and grade higher than than cattle of any other color. Right. Statistically. So they will typically give a little bit more money for black cattle. Right. So uh, a lot of people pay attention to that. We we breed for black cattle. Sure. Uh, you know, I have sure. black bulls. And, and I have a few Charlotte cows, a few white cows. But I can put black bulls on them and make those Charlay cows have black calves. So I can gain some of the good traits from those Charlays, mm-hmm. but I can make her calf have a black hide. Well, and, and if I was going to feed some two or three steers up, the smart thing for me to do would be find three black steers. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because they're going to stand a higher likelihood of grading higher. Right. Absolutely. Uh, right. Uh, having a better carcass and a little bit better beef, a little bit more what you're looking for. Now, what has the grass-fed market done to this, none of the economics of the cattle business? They'll pay. A, that's a big popular thing right They'll now. pay a premium, a little bit of premium, just for grass-fed beef, and they need to because that grass-fed calf will take longer to reach a certain weight. So you know, if it takes longer for him to get there, he costs the producer more money to get him there. Well, so, all right, so uh, if you send an 850-pound steer to the feed yard, what's he going to weigh when they kill him? 11? Oh, typically about 1,400. Yeah, about 14, Oh, way more yeah, than that, 1,400. Yeah. About four, yeah, 1,400 pounds. 1,400 pounds. Yep. So if you're going to kill a grass-fed steer, what does he need to weigh? They want him to weigh up yeah. close to that? Yeah. That means he's way older then. Mm-hmm. Yep. On grass to make the same way to beef, right? That's correct. And he's been around longer, so he's going to 
cost the producer more money. Yes. To generate because you don't have a chance to turn a profit <laughs> yes. on him. And his meat, he's not going to grade the same as a calf that's been raised on corn. No, it's his impossible. His marbling will be different. His marbling will be, he, he won't have any marbling mm-hmm. or not nearly as much. And his fat's a different color, isn't yeah. it? His fat's more yellow. That meat will have a little more texture to it right. than, than a corn fed. I have had yeah. grass fed beef before and I didn't like the flavor. And this is, different. you know, it, it tastes different. more like venison to me. Uh, kind of gamey. It's, it's, it's got a stronger flavor. Uh, it's something I could get used to, but I prefer grain-fed, grain-fed beef, and I think most people do. Uh, grass-fed is real popular right now. Now, grass-fed hamburger, that'd be fine. Yeah, you never but they're going to have to add fat to grass-fed hamburger, mm-hmm. and where the fat comes from might be real critical to the to the integrity of the product, right? Is it grass-fed? If they had to add 20% fat to it, who donated the fat? <laughs> well, it wasn't the grass-fed. No, it was a fat calf. It was a fat calf that had been been finished on grain. So, uh, yeah, grass-fed is an interesting development. I think that's probably about 10 years ago everybody started trying to be real uh, – careful about eating grass fed and i understand that the i mean the the fatty acid profile is probably healthier in grass fed animals than it is in grain fed animals but i don't eat steak often enough to where i mean if i was eating three steaks a day i might have to be concerned about that but but since i don't uh when i eat a steak i want a i want a grain fed steak i want marbling i want some the flavor that that kind of fat produces. I prefer that, and I think most people do. Beef is the most wholesome, satisfying meal that you can have in America today. Mm-hmm. Safest. As far as I'm concerned, uh, if you don't have access to elk meat, oh. I prefer elk meat. Elk meat's delicious. <laughs> oh, God. It's, have you ever had moose? Not moose. Oh, elk, yes, but not moose. Elk's good. Elk hamburger, oh, it's good, but most people don't have access to it. Yeah. So, from what's commonly available to you in the grocery store, beef is the best deal. Now, we're just talking about the beef industry here. Uh, the pork industry is a different matter entirely. Uh, I'm glad I'm not in the pork business. One of the reasons pork is so cheap is because that process is very, very efficient. That's true. That's exactly right. Because the, you know, gestation period in a pig is so short. So, right. you know. They, those those uh, sows will have three litters a year, mm-hmm. won't they? It's three months, three, three weeks, weeks, and three, three days. days. Is in a, every and so sow. they'll breed them three times a year. See, and then and every, every litter is 10 or 12 and pigs. And in three months, they can reproduce. They're, they're ready to go. Cow gestation is nine months. I thought it was 11 months. That's horse. That's horse. Oh, yeah, all right. Horses are 11 months. Cows are nine. Mm-hmm. About like us. Yeah, it's hard to defend the pork industry, but we're not talking about pork. We're talking about cattle. And cattle. the cattle industry has been as maligned as ever, any other thing. You know, these people will come up with video shot in China and uh, and pretend as though... This is representative of the U.S. beef industry, and it's it's not. It's absolutely not. What I wanted to take away, what I want everybody to take away from our podcast today is that the beef industry in the United States is not what you have been told. All right, it's the our factory beef in the world. It's the safest beef in the world, and to the extent we have a factory, it's my mesquite pasture in Wichita County. That's the beef factory. That's the factory farm, all right? And uh, cattle producers do an excellent job of turning land that cannot be farmed into delicious beef that you need to eat more of, okay? So just keep this in mind, and don't be lied to about this because it's, it's, it's not good to be lied to, okay? Jenny Johnson, thank you. For coming in and helping us with Thank this, you. Richard, my friend. Thank you, Mark. As always, Appreciate it's good it. to see you, and we'll see you next time on Starting Break Radio. <laughs>